um, session is part of the open source digital preservation and access stream. Thanks to Chris Lisinick. Um We're very happy that he chose this uh, presentation. Um, this is about um, uh, Hydra, which is an open source software uh, for digital uh, access, digital preservation and management. Um, and you'll hear about that in the presentation. Um, but I'm going to first run through all the speakers um, so that you know who they are. Um, I'm Karen Cariani, Director of the Media Library and Archives at WGBH in Boston. We're public television. We have 60 years of audiovisual materials in our collection. Um, I'm going to talk about Hydra Dam, which is a project that we have developed um, and give you a little bit of an intro about Hydra. Then John Dunn, who is Director and Interim Assistant Dean for Library Technologies, Technologies at Indiana University Bloomington Libraries, is going to talk about Avalon. He oversees IT support, software development, user experience, and digital repository systems. He's been involved in the development of digital library systems for audio and video for over 20 years and currently serves as the director of the Avalon Media Systems Project. And he's going to talk about Avalon. Stefan Elnaboli will come next. <laughs> um, he's the moving image and sound preservation specialist at Northwestern University Library. He manages the digitization projects and contributes to the library's overall preservation and access mission. He is also a member of the team developing the Avalon Media System, a Hydra project. So Avalon is a, um, a product of two universities, collaborations, Indiana University and Northwestern. Uh, John's going to talk about Indiana University's role and Stefan's going to talk about Northwestern's. And then Hannah Frost is going to speak and she's been engaged in media preservation and digital preservation efforts at Stanford University Library since 2001. Uh, Hannah is the services manager for the Stanford Digital Repository and Enterprise System for Long-Term Preservation of Digital Content. In this capacity, she has worked on two Hydra Head projects. Hannah also manages the Stanford Media Preservation Lab, SMPL. And I have to say, Stanford is really good about naming things <laughs> with an acronym. They just they have excellent acronyms. <laughs> Um, it's a, that's a facility she developed for preserving and providing access to sound recordings and moving images held in Stanford's collections. So those are our speakers. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, GBH's efforts and an overview of, Stamp of uh, Hydra. So uh, we were generously awarded a grant to see if we could build a media preservation dam system using open source software. In particular, we wanted to test the Hydra stack uh, to see what it would take to build it, what it would take for others to install it, um, to build some better documentation for installation, and to see really how, it might how we might integrate with the open source community. Um, so um, what do we need for a digital me uh, media preservation system for digital files um, that was different from a straight digital library system? What makes media management different? You all know that analog to digital is more or less a controlled scenario where you can determine the formats of the files that are coming out of your digital digitization project. But born digital can be very different with many, many, many different file formats depending on the camera that's used. So, and there are many different sizes. So we need to manage many different file formats. Um, something for access and preservation. We want to make our materials accessible. And you want to be able to see what you have. So we also need a system that's easy to migrate. The technology is easy to move it forward. And it's not expensive to migrate, because as we all know, we have to do that probably every three to five years now. Um, and something that's easy to evolve as the workflows change and as technology changes. So a quick check on preservation needs. Um, this digital stuff, in my mind, really sucks. <laughs> um, film <laughs> or stone. <laughs> It's much, much easier, it's a much la longer lasting medium, and it's much easier to, to keep. Um, but digital files give us much be better and broader access. So how do we preserve this fragile stuff that needs migration every three to five years? Um, you're going to need multiple copies. You're going to need to save the originals. Um, you're going to need to do checksums and validity checks on your digital files to make sure you have all the bits all the time. Um, migration of not only the content, but you're going to also have to migrate the files, the technology, the systems you're, you're using, and the software, and the storage. And doing all of this with big media files is hard, time consuming, and um, can be subject to errors and damage to the files. So why did WGBH choose Hydra? Well, it's open source, so we can evolve it as our needs change, 
and we can make sure it has features and functionality that we want and need. Um, it may be cheaper in the long run, but it is not free. And I am going to like use this <laughs> mantra uh, a lot um, that it is not free beer, it is a free puppy or a free kitten. Here I'm using the kitten <laughs> analogy. Um, it still needs an investment of time and people and equipment, and all that in, and all that investment is towards a, but but all that investment is towards a product that we actually define ourselves for our own needs. So we mostly chose Hydra because I was really impressed with the community. Um, the community is very committed to sharing and supporting. The quality of the thought and work coming out of the community is excellent. And the institutions that are involved are very established and long living. They are very sustainable institutions. So what is Hydra? Um, it's a robust repository based on, Fedora, repo based on Fedora as the repository with applications tailored to targeting funct targeted functionality. There are gems that can be leveraged to, and to build new bundles or solutions. The community of developers is very friendly and welcoming. There is training thanks to digital curation experts, which I think Mark is in the audience. Mark is in the audience. Um, they run HydraCamp, um, so they, they do trainings for new developers coming into the community, which is fabulous. They also um, give vendor support, so you can hire them to actually come and help you get your system up and running, to, to add new features, to um, if you need some support for your development. Um, and they're very much part of the sharing community. So almost everything that they develop and create goes back into the community is open source. So it's open and, and the software is open and available through an Apache license. Um, so this is a picture of the Hydra community at Hydra Connect in January. Um, it's been steadily growing. Um, a very compelling reason to adopt Hydra technically is that it's a way to take advantage of the benefits of Fedora as a repository. There are other solutions that also do that, but Hydra's strength really is its community. And at a time when we're all asked to do more with less and faster, and work, working in a community where everyone has a shared purpose and goal makes that a lot easier. We all need the systems to do basically the same thing in managing our digital objects. So why not leverage that work together and work together to build code that works? Um, and the only way to build rich and robust solution is to engage a large community of developers. The only way to build a sustainable solution is to spur adoption by the community of institutions with vested interest in a shared success. This shows the growth of the Hydra community of partners and adopters. And I just want to note that OR14 was in June. So from June to now, there was a huge spurt of adopters. It's a very fast growing community. Um, a single application could not effectively cope with the use cases. However, any institution would want to safeguard the outputs of all these disparate systems in a digital repository for management and preservation. Hydra gives a framework where one body, the, re the repository, can support multiple heads, tailored applications. So you can put all kinds of different content into your repository and have Hydra heads that actually focus on applications to the users for specific types of content, if that's the way you want to present it. So in addition, we wanted to be able to customize the interface, have the core functionality of managing digital objects, ingest, store, search, retrieve, describe, relate, and preserve. And of course, as soon as we got our NEH grant to develop this system, our developer left. <laughs> um, and it took us about a year to hire their replacement. But in the meantime, what we did is we hired DCE to get us started. And within, I would say, three to four months, they had something up and running that we could test. Um, given our functionality needs, they decided to build our system off a system built at Penn State called Sophia. So we were starting from a point where there was code already built, and we were adding our new functionality to that code. It had many of the Sophia had many of the functionality that we had requested, key being self-deposit, the ability for us to ingest any file format. Um, we added in FFmpeg to transcode for the creation of proxies and thumbnails for the video files, and a PBCore export. Uh, we also did some workflow messaging around the download of files because it takes so long to move the very large preservation files across the network and our, our users were getting very impatient in terms of waiting for those files to download. So we added some messaging into the system to basically say, yes, we got your request, hang on, be patient, we'll let you know when the file is ready for you to download. Um, these are our interfaces. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, we're gonna do a demo at the lightning talk later tonight, later 
this afternoon. Hopefully it'll work. Um, so please come to the Lightning Talks later. So I'm going to run through these interface slides really quickly. Um, this is where it shows you, the yellow button shows you that you can down, it's getting ready to download. Um, this is the thumbnail with all of the metadata. Um, that was, so there it tells you the files available for download. This is telling you it's offline. Please check the queue. It's, it's, it's coming soon. So um, what are we doing? Well, we're trying to do something that's already complicated, so we don't need a complicated system to add to that challenge. Uh, we're trying to now simplify our workflow in general. Um, the systems are expensive to maintain and migrate. Uh, we've decided that what we do best is organize stuff, so we should be organizing our materials. We should be putting it somewhere safe where we can retrieve it and where we can easily find it again. So why can't we do that with digital stuff, and how do we do that with digital stuff? Uh, we decided that we shouldn't try to build a system that does everything for everything for everyone. Um, it, that's a hard discipline, especially in media, because you sort of feel like every it should be available all the time and everybody should be able to do everything with it. But we really decided that as the archive, our goal is to preserve the material, store it someplace safe, and be able to retrieve it again when somebody wants it. So how did we do that? We decided to focus on that as our mission. Um, it's particularly with this system. So we're aware that there are other systems that are open and flexible enough to share. So as long as what we build in the archives can hook into the other systems that our station is building for editing, for production, for broadcast, then we think we're okay. So we as the archive are really focusing on that preservation piece and making sure the, that system that we build for preservation is open and can hook into those, the other systems. Uh, our biggest challenge is that we're working with lots and lots of files, lots of different formats, and they're very big files. So how can we do this with our limited resources? Um, we did decide to change our workflow. Um, with Hydrodan, we're doing the entire large essence file handling locally, not over the network. We have found that moving the big files across our network was just too slow, too painful, probably causing some errors in the files and corruption. Um, users were getting really impatient. They kept claiming the system's not working because they weren't getting their files fast enough. So we've taken that piece out of the mix. We have a powerful Mac Pro connected to an external LTO6 drive, as well as connections for all different kinds of hard drives that may be delivered to the archives from other departments as part of accessioning. HydroDam is running on a virtual machine server, and as the individual files are being processed, fixity checks are conducted to maintain the file authenticity as the files are being copied. The files are delivered to the Media Library and Archives by either external or internal hard drives or over the network, provided the infrastructure is there to actually support it. We are actually preferring that people bring us the, the drives themselves. HydroDam is flexible enough to support ingest from a variety of sources, which is great. HydroDam then creates a data record of each file, attaches the fixity data, as well as the characterization data to the record. The local Mac Pro machine then creates a proxy file using FFmpeg. FFmpeg is an open source application that decodes many of the different audio and video files. So um, I would say that probably HydroDam at this point will transcode maybe 80% of the file formats that we'll get. So as we ingest into the system, a proxy will be created, a thumbnail will be created for those 80% so that you can actually see what's there and users can go in and search and actually see what the content is. The extra 20% that they can't get a thumbnail or a proxy for, they'll have a data record, they'll have a description of it, but if they actually want to see it, they're going to have to download those files. And that was our compromise because we were not going to be able to find a system that was always going to be able to transcode all the files all the time. So we sort of focused on the key ones that covered 80% of the files. Uh, the proxy location is added to the asset record as well as the ability to download the proxy file. Metadata is either done manually using the website in HydroDam or it can be batch uploaded and attached to records for each asset. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we're still requiring d documents uh, departments to submit our FileMaker database, we can import a FileMaker maker record, attach it to the Hy HydroDam asset records or a CSV or an Excel, as long as the proper field mapping is in place. And that's all that HydroDam does. It points to the location of the proxy files, it stores the metadata in the Fedora repository. Uh, the Fedora repository stores all the metadata and can be exposed to other applications that need access to it when we need to do that. So source files are delivered by hard drives or the network. Um, the HydroDam is running the fixity checks. Um, the files are being copied to a locally connected LTO6 tape which is running also an MD5 fixity check. 
and then copying the files to another one. So we have two copies. One, one copy is in our vault, one copy is off-site. The serial number of the LTO6 tape as well as the uh, GBH barcode uh, becomes part of the metadata asset record in Hydrodan. And then when the files have completed transcoding and copying, um, a, another copy is made. Um, the copy is sent off-site for storage while the, while the original source drive is stored in our vault. So then when people actually request our preservation files, we will go to the vault, pull the LT LTO6 tape, spin the file up on our workstation, and they will come and actually retrieve that file on a hard drive or a thumb drive or whatever. So it's very much the same as how we handle physical tapes these days, where they make a request, we go to the vault, we pull the tape, they come to our offices and they pick up the tape. This way they're just picking up a file. So the delivery of those preservation files is not happening over the network. And we actually found that that was a lot faster. <laughs> um, people were actually pulling tapes and digitizing them again because it was faster than pulling the big files through the network. So we've sort of done that in a digital form now. Um, so I think, uh, so the flexibility of that is um, allowing us um, we, we have an HSM system, we're moving away from the current HSM system at the moment um, because it uses the network and it's a robotic tape. We may end up going back to it at some point when we upgrade our, our uh, infrastructure and the network internally, but for right now, and we have the hooks to be able to do that, but for right now we are going to continue to work on our local LTO6 workstation. Um, so we wanted some other institutions in this project to test our install and to test the system to get feedback on whether the documentation was clear enough that they could actually do the install themselves. So our two partners were WNYC in New York and SCETV in South Carolina. Um, and they gave us amazing feedback for the documentation which helped us improve it, helped us improve the install. DC went back and actually um, uh, improved the code for the install and improved a lot of the documentation which they then also ended up using migrating to other versions of the work that they have now used for other institutions. So, um, so uh, we were testing an open source solution and we were trying to figure out um, you know, whether or not it was a good solution for us. The NEH project gave us that luxury and opportunity, which we're very thankful for because probably otherwise we wouldn't have undertaken it. Um, in the decision process, um, it's not easy and cheap. Um, open source is not a free puppy, it's not a free kitten. It does take um, a lot of time and people and development and energy. Um, but at the end of the day, it is, you will have a product that you built yourself, um, that fill, fulfills your needs. Um, there are no turnkey solutions yet, so just make sure you know that. Um, but there's a really strong community out there building these solutions to these challenges and needs, and that support and knowledge is really the best leverage in terms of moving in this direction. Um, it's coming from academic institutions with really long histories, uh, strong track records and technology, and more resources for their libraries. Um, they have audiovisual materials in their collections and they need these solutions too. So it seems like it's a really good win-win to, to uh, collaborate with them. So uh, Hydra is one body and many heads. It's a single op uh, application, could not effectively cope with all of the use cases that you might need. Um, and any institution would want to safeguard the outputs of all of these different systems. So um, Hydra gives a framework where there is one body, the repository, and it can support many heads without tailored applications. So we're going to move on to John Dunn, who's going to talk about Avalon. Thanks, Karen. That was a, a great introduction, I think, to Hydra and uh, the, the power of uh, the technology and of, of the community. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, another Hydra head uh, or Hydra-based pro project that uh, serves some different use cases and uh, has approached development in, in a slightly different way than, uh, than the WGBH Hydra Dam has. Uh, so Avalon Media System. Uh, is uh, a Hydra head that uh, is oriented around access to uh, audio and video uh, digitized or digital materials. So the goal was uh, to create an open source system that lets libraries and archives uh, more easily provide online access uh, to media collections. Uh, we are open source, obviously, uh, uh, being a part of Hydra and based on Hydra, 
Uh, we're using what's called an agile uh, development methodology that I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Uh, we're trying to leverage as existing technologies as much as possible. And we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here, but really uh, fill in gaps that we think aren't addressed by uh, current solutions. And uh, a big part of this project uh, that's being carried out jointly by uh, Indiana University and Northwestern University is to kind of communicate and market the project, engage other uh, implementers, uh, users, potential partners uh, to try to grow a community to help sustain uh, what we're building over time. So, uh, and the work I'm talking about is funded uh, in part by a grant from uh, IMLS, the Institute, Institute of Museum and Library Services. Uh, that uh, will run through September of next year. Uh, and uh, there are some other, other funding things we're currently working on to, to help uh, keep this going beyond that. Uh, beyond uh, Indiana University and Northwestern University, we have a number of other institutions that have been involved either as um, pilot implementers uh, or uh, advisors, as in, in WGBH's case, uh, to help us make sure we're building something that is of use beyond just Indiana and Northwestern universities, but really can serve uh, a general set of, uh, of use cases for access to, uh, to media uh, collections. So uh, we started developing this uh, back in 2011. Before then, we spent about a year um, uh, kind of looking at requirements, talking to people, talking to other institutions, trying to formulate a technical plan uh, and a, uh, a plan of what functionality uh, we were trying to build, and so we uh, had our first release a little over two years ago, and uh, our most recent release uh, came out this past July. We have a, uh, an another version uh, coming out yet this fall, and then a, m a more major uh, uh, version with some, some significant new features we hope to come out uh, in the spring of next year. And we're trying to release um, major versions roughly every six months and, and minor versions of, uh, uh, every three months or so. We're still working on getting to that sort of pattern. Uh, as, uh, so this is based on Hydra, and, and Karen kind of described that Hydra is this kind of underlying uh, set of technologies and framework for developing repository applications and front ends, but it's not a front end application uh, itself. Uh, one other thing to note about Hydra is uh, in terms of technologies you know, that were discussed in the earlier session, Hydra is based on the uh, Ruby on Rails framework. Uh, so the code is written in the Ruby uh, programming language. And um, it, it is uh, using the uh, uh, Rails uh, model uh, that has, is the basis of many uh, successful web applications. The, the big difference is uh, instead of a relational database backing all of your data, there is a uh, Fedora repository sitting there. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this diagram of, of, of Avalon's architecture, uh, but um, it can at least give you the sense that Avalon is made up of a lot of other components, including pieces that come from Hydra, the Fedora repository, some other technologies like the uh, search engine, Solar. Um, we're using uh, uh, another product currently called OpenCast Matterhorn to help manage our transcoding workflow. That uses FFmpeg underneath, though. Uh, and uh, Avalon is designed to integrate with uh, a number of other systems that are typically in place within an institution, um, such as uh, existing metadata systems, uh, authentication services, authorization services, storage services, uh, streaming services. And I'll, t I'll talk a little bit more about that. So just to give you more of a sense of what Avalon actually does, and I think Stefan will dig into this a bit more in the context of a particular institution's uh, uh, workflow uh, and, and uses of Avalon. But some of the basic functions that Avalon provides is it provides the ability for users to come in and browse and search uh, metadata uh, for media items that are available to them. And uh, th uh, the items that are available to a given user will vary depending on access controls that, that are in place. I'll talk a bit more about that. So we, and Blacklight is another open source piece of software that is part of Hydra, that is a, uh, a, a search uh, interface and browse interface uh, that uses uh, uh, the uh, solar uh, uh, indexing system. It's used more and more by libraries to provide front ends to their library catalogs. So for example, Stanford uses it, I, Indiana uses it, uh, University of Virginia, and others have their main library catalog uh, is based on Blacklight. So we're using Blacklight uh, as a key piece of this. Uh, we have a, a player that's based on uh, 
media element JS uh, that can deliver to pretty much all desktop and, and mobile platforms and supports uh, switching between different quality versions of uh, uh, tra different transcodes of a particular uh, media item uh, and can be embedded into other contexts. So content in Avalon can be embedded into blogs, into uh, Omeka exhibits, into other kinds of websites. Uh, then for uh, the staff user, there's a whole kind of content management interface piece of Avalon. So you can set up collections, you can delegate uh, the management of those collections to different groups of people, give people different roles in terms of being able to add, delete, uh, edit metadata for, uh, for items and collections. Uh, content, uh, video and audio files can be loaded into Avalon through a number of different uh, methods, including upload via a web page, uh, deposit in a Dropbox directory on a server. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to do a batch uh, uh, load of a lot of media items and metadata uh, at once. Because we are using FFmpeg under the covers as is WGBH, we can deal with most uh, media file formats and Avalon will then handle the transcoding of those using FFmpeg to formats for delivery on the web. Or if you already have your video in transcoded in the form you like, you can load that directly and bypass the, uh, the transcoding step. For descriptive metadata in Avalon to support that searching and browsing interface and, and identifying a, a video or audio file that, that one has, has discovered, uh, we're using uh, the mods, uh, uh, a set of metadata elements based on the mods standard. Um, and I should note, we expect actually that a lot of, a lot of discovery of items in an, in an Avalon uh, environment will not take place in Avalon itself, but rather this is taking place through web search engines such as Google through existing mark-based library catalogs, through existing uh, uh, archival finding aid delivery services, and so forth. So Avalon does have this search capability and browse capability, but it's not certainly not the only place people will be searching for and browsing to, to find things. And then finally, one of the, the key pieces of Avalon is the access control capability. So if you load a piece of media into Avalon, uh, you can restrict that in various ways. You can, you can make it available to anyone who comes in. You can restrict it to users who can log in to Avalon. You can restrict it just to the staff who are managing a given collection. Or you can restrict it to particular groups of users or individual users um, uh, as you wish. Uh, and that can, that can tie into your, uh, your institution's directory services in terms of things like Microsoft Active Directory or uh, LDAP services. Uh, as well as with uh, course management or learning management systems. So if you have media that you want to restrict, for example, uh, in a university setting to members, uh, students in a particular course. Uh, and Avalon also can work with a couple of different systems for establishing a permanent URL or handle for items that are, uh, are loaded in so that you have a, a URL that will remain the same for that piece of media uh, over time. Just to talk a bit about the process uh, through which we've developed Avalon, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, this is developed between Indiana and Northwestern universities. And we have had a single development team spread across those two institutions uh, using uh, what's called an agile uh, scrum process of two week sprints of work working on a defined set of, of user stories uh, that we're trying to deliver functionality for. Uh, our code is in uh, GitHub, uh, as, as was discussed earlier, uh, and is publicly available. Uh, we do a lot of work online, but uh, we, we find it important to get together for face-to-face -to -face meetings to work on longer range planning and uh, other things like that. And the teams between Indiana and Northwestern are meeting on a, this is part of the scrum process, on a daily basis for 15 minutes every morning uh, via audio or video conference to, to touch base and make sure uh, things are moving forward. Uh, so this shows uh, some of the, the, shows the development team uh, between the two institutions. Uh, and, but one thing to note is we've had this model of tight, this tight team between Indiana and Northwestern developing the system. But one of our goals in making Avalon an open source uh, system is to engage additional institutions and individuals in the development over time, either through directly contributing uh, software development time or uh, possibly uh, money to fund software development time on, on the part of others. Uh, and so that's one of the challenges, I think, over the next couple of years is moving from this, this sort of tight-knit team that's developed this initial product that can now be the basis for 
uh, more community-based development over time. So we have a number of uh, institutions who are currently implementing Avalon uh, uh, beyond IU and Northwestern. You'll hear about uh, one of those uh, here a bit later. Uh, we're working, continue to work on new features uh, uh, in new versions uh, to come in the future. And our, our, we have a product roadmap that is, is on the uh, uh, link to from our website uh, if you're interested in, in more details there. I mentioned needing to deal with contributions from the community, uh, being able to integrate with other tools, uh, for example, uh, being able to use HydroDam, for example, as a preservation solution, and then use Avalon for, for, for public delivery is something we're, we're really interested in. And kind of getting a model in place to make all of this work going forward and sustain uh, the, the project uh, is, is a key, key focus. We're also looking uh, talking with uh, potential partners to offer a hosted uh, version of Avalon, so if an institution doesn't have the resources or want to spin this up locally, that, that there could be a cloud option for that. That's still in very early stages. Though. Uh, so that's, that's Avalon, and really briefly I'm going to talk about uh, use at IU. We've been in a pilot phase for about a year now, and uh, you can visit our, our site and see what's there, but uh, we've been working with various use cases involving the uh, Film archive, IU, uh, library's film archive for both um, IU owned materi uh, materials, which IU owns the rights and can, can be made publicly available, as well as serving uh, access to individual uh, researchers uh, uh, for requests to specific items. We've been working with video course reserves, with uh, some video recordings of conferences, and, and some other use cases. So we're, this is not just for archival collections, though archival collections are, are, are a key set of use cases for us. And then also Avalon is uh, going to be an access component in IU's uh, broader media digitization uh, and preservation initiative uh, that's generating quite a bit of audio and video data uh, that we want to make as accessible as we can given rights issues. And so there, there are going to be a number of uh, uh, things to address there, especially in terms of integration with our local infrastructure and workflows uh, that we'll be digging into in the near future. And Avalon is focused on access. It's not focused on preservation. It complements a preservation solution. Uh, and so for, uh, for our preservation, we're really interested in the HydroDam work of WGBH and how we can tie that in with uh, some storage resources we have at IU to, to sit with Avalon to kind of form a, a complete preservation and access uh, um, uh, set of options for us. So uh, there's more on Avalon at our website. And I think I'll stop there. and. Uh, uh, turn things over to uh, Stefan uh, to talk a bit more about um, specific uh, implementation at Northwestern. Everybody. Um, my name is Stefan uh, El Nabli. I work um, at Northwestern University Library in the Digital Collections Department. Um, I am the uh, moving image, my title is the moving image and sound preservation specialist. And um, within the department, I serve that function, but I'm also on the team developing, um, helping to develop a Avalon Media System with um, Indiana University um, in that Hydra framework. And while I'm not specifically writing code, I am contributing in areas um, having to do with uh, metadata requirements, file encoding, playback experience, um, workflow design, um, these, these various pieces that uh, help inform the development of the product. Uh, so that's tailored to uh, practical contexts for users like archivists and librarians that are working with digital media collections um, that they want to make accessible. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Northwestern's situation um, with their digital repository um, in the library and the services that we've been building in the Hydra con uh, framework, and then show how we've utilized Hydra in the form of Avalon uh, to manage our access collections, um, which um, is pretty fresh for us. So we've been uh, working on the development of this for the past couple of years, but we just launched a production system with dedicated hardware um, to build collections and to serve them for uh, faculty, um, researchers, curators, 
um, and even opening it up to outside library units that want to manage collections within Avalon, um, which is a pretty exciting thing to be able to offer that service to other uh, parts of the university. So um, I work in the digital collections department. Um, it's part of the larger technology, uh, li uh, larger technology division at the library. Uh, that includes enterprise systems, IT, uh, and web technologies. And so um, we primarily serve faculty, students, and special library units. And that's our special collections, our university archives, music library, et cetera. These are where we have our archival media collections. So you're going to see the legacy formats, various film formats, uh, various magnetic media formats. Um, and we've been ramping up our digitization program to um, to make these things accessible, but we didn't have a very robust system to provide access to those collections, and so Avalon was the direction that we wanted to take it. So we've been streaming media since 2001. Um, we currently have well above 50,000 media assets, um, and currently uh, our streaming infrastructure, the, the one that, um, that preceded Avalon, is it's pretty long in the tooth. It hasn't changed in many years. Um, we have two separate servers uh, serving two different types of, of formats for different, different bandwidth scenarios. So um, there's no one central place to do that. Um, we rely on external players that add another level of support and uh, uh, issues and without any flexibility. Um, and there was no real centralized management of the access media, so we had to rely on dis disparate tracking methods. Uh, that are more difficult to use as we exponentially grow our digital collections. So you can kind of um, get an idea of what things we have in our repository. If you go to digital.library.northwestern.edu, you can kind of get an idea of how we design our access platforms uh, to, to kind of serve our users in dynamic ways. Um, this is an interesting collection where we created 3D models of, of, of uh, masks uh, for users to interact with. So in our digital repository in 2006, uh, we've been developing services and collections in a Fedora Commons digital object repository. Um, we've expanded uh, to include services for audiovisual assets, and we've begun to build collections uh, within it for access. And our legacy audiovisual reformatting has really shown us the necessity for having the system because um, as we start to digitize things at the collection level where we're dealing with hundreds and even thousands of items, um, we needed a more streamlined process to be able to describe those things, ingest them into uh, a, a place where they can be managed and then disseminated for users. So um, conceptually, the functional components of our repository um, and our access platforms interact to kind of form this kind of infrastructure where you have the core repository, it interacts with our Isilon storage, and then we have these various Hydra heads um, for um, media in Avalon, um, images in, in DIL, which is a digital image library, and those things also have to be hooked up to their own uh, streaming servers um, and image servers. So these components, when they get put together, things start to get complex, and even looking at this top level view, um, you can sometimes overlook the fact that there are many different uh, technologies uh, within um, this open source development um, ideal that we're trying to, to create that are combined to create uh, and put together to make the repository. So we joined as a partner in Hydra in 2011 and we've been developing services um, uh, through the Hydra framework. One of them is our digital image library. Um, we've been involved in a, in a, a cross-institutional development of a shared institutional repository, but one of the most uh, more important things to the people in this room is our is Avalon Media System, um, which is where our access files and end-user facing metadata is prepared and disseminated. Um, so Avalon has always been intended to uh, replace our current streaming infrastructure. And like John said, it isn't a preservation system. It's, it's the thing that, that sits on top of the repository that has its own preservation services um, that can provide access to the collections. So essentially, we really needed to replace existing workflows with ones that are more streamlined. Um, and we needed to provide an easy way to link our audiovisual resources uh, uh, with courses um, and to lock access down per item for different scenarios. So we serve many different types of users. We have students, faculty, 
researchers, curators, um, and, and the list goes on. And each one has specific uh, contexts that you have to deliver the video or the audio. And just to give you an idea of our media collection, so we have, um, we have a fairly large circulating video collection. It has all the familiar formats that, um, that you might see in your own collections for, for circulation. Uh, Music Library also has uh, our circulating audio collection, but our Special Libraries division is where the bulk of our archival media collections are. Um, and to give you an idea of one collection that we've been working with that became um, a pilot collection with Avalon, and now that we've gone into production, we're starting to build it up more, um, is our Wildcats football film collection. So we have over 2,000 reels of 60 millimeter film. Uh, the digitization alone poses challenges and considerations, um, and we're fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to work with people that can help us do that. Um, and since we've been, begun digitizing the collection, we found that our current access methods just don't meet the needs of the collection. Um, so we'll go from this, this reel on a shelf, we'll, uh, we'll do the, our due diligence to, um, to preserve the actual physical item, and then we'll digitize it and have an accessible media file um, and that is stored in our repository, uh, but the method for access was just a little bit unclear. Um, because we wanted to provide a lot of things. Currently, our university archives with the football films that we've had, they, they have a YouTube channel, so it's a public collection. They'll upload their videos to YouTube, but that's as far as the management can go. Um, um, we needed an access service on top of the repository. Uh, we needed to integrate it with our identity management system. Um, we needed granular access control. We needed rich meta metadata capabilities. Um, we needed multi-platform streaming, so uh, not only different browsers, but different devices and different bandwidth scenarios. Um, uh, a student, let's say the dentist's office using wi uh, public Wi-Fi is going to have a much different playback experience than somebody um, on our campus using our Blazing Fast network. Um, we needed to integrate it with our learning management system. We're currently using Blackboard. We're in a slow transition to move to Canvas. And this has been um, an interesting uh, uh, connection to, to make when we're developing the, um, the, the system to be able to get course inf membership information and be able to provide resources specifically to students within the course in a time-limited fashion. So they'll be available for the fall semester and then we can take it away when the class is over. Um, we also really wanted to have support for non-library units to self-manage content. Um, we have been developing more policies in our repository to, for intaking collections and we've become more liberal, liberal with people to allow them to give it to us so that we can start to manage it. However, um, when they start to ask us to um, do the work to describe those collections um, and make them accessible to their needs, um, we start to lose sight of, of what we need to do in the library. And so we needed a system that we can, uh, we can give access to people so that they can self-manage their content and do what they need to do with it um, and also kind of be siloed so those collections don't get mixed up with our library collections. So we've been able to achieve that, so the solution is Avalon. So um, John gave you kind of this, the, the view of Avalon um, as the, the product. Um, I'm going to go through some of the, the similar layouts uh, that you'd see, but more of an, in a branded Northwestern context and speak a little bit about um, how we're using it in our workflow and how, how it's working in our context. Two minutes? Okay. Um, so um, we have the, uh, the user interface for, for um, faceted browsing. We have two collections, the Robert Marcel's Masterclass Audio Collection and, and University uh, Football Films. Can, you can look at it using media.northwestern.edu. We've been building our football collection within it and centralizing it to a managed environment um, so that they're browsable and editable. Um, we have assigned um, to our staff different roles of based in the collection to be able to manipulate it and provide access to it in, in different ways. So we have administrator, manager, editor, and depositor roles. This is a, an example of how we've customized the system for our needs because these, um, these permissions are a little bit different from core. So we have, um, we have re uh, digitization requests. Um, they get assigned to different production staff. They perform the digitization. 
we can put it in Avalon, um, we can uh, create status updates for um, our faculty or whoever's making the request to see where it is in that queue, um, and then we can uh, make it accessible. And so there's different methods, as John described, for uploading files. Um, however, when we're building our collection, for example, our football films collection, we sometimes have to upload hundreds of files at a time. So we build them in kind of this batch format where you create a package of information with assets and a manifest file. Um, okay. The, um, basically, we've, we've opened up uh, Avalon to be able to um, uh, interact with other people in the library. So bibliographic services can actually contribute metadata. We can structure different, um, different files and we can assign special access and, and, and um, make it visible to um, courses, specifically locked down for courses, um, and then have our video and our metadata accessible entirely. So we are now in the process of migrating and, and learning about our scalability right now. So new content that's generated is being served in Avalon. We have old content that needs to be transcoded, um, metadata needs to be created, uh, structural organization needs to be in place, etc. And so we are investigating scalability and we're addressing this, uh, the, the migration needs and we're pretty much off to a good start, so thanks. Nobody has mentioned yet is that when, one thing that comes with Hydra is cool t shirts. <laughs> Got one on today. <laughs> In the interest of time, I won't. Uh, we have and we have stickers. You just have to show up at one of the meetings. <laughs> That's the little secret. All right. Okay. So, um, hi, I'm Hannah from Stanford, and uh, I think my talk will echo some of the points that Stefan just made about Avalon at Northwestern. We have not adopted Avalon yet, so what I'm going to talk about here today is kind of the the situation at Stanford and the kind of the conditions that got us to the point of, of deciding to adopt Avalon. So um, as uh, Karen mentioned in the introduction, we have a media preservation program at Stanford that has a, a number of objectives and I imagine that any media preservation you all are doing have very similar objectives. I won't go through them here, but uh, we have been at this for coming on a decade. We have, um, this is my colleague Michael Angeletti, We've digitized over 13,000 items in our uh, audio and video labs. Um, and just going back to, I will highlight a couple of these objectives. I'm trying to hurry up because I, I want to make time for questions. Um, uh, one thing in particular we're really worried and thinking about is uh, teaching and research, supporting use of media and teaching and research. And uh, another key objective of ours is developing expertise, best practices, and community. Um, so Michael has done a lot of work in the, in the preservation. We've developed a lot of expertise and we're sharing that expertise through things like our VTR refurbishment project, the one inch or the half inch EIAJ. And of course we've been involved in the AV artifact process and that's a uh, project and that's been um, a wonderful way to build community around what we're doing. So you, we have made some progress on our objectives and these are of course ongoing efforts, but we have some real, um, you know, some concerns about the things that aren't checked off here. Uh, these are areas where we've seen we have gaps. Sorry for the tired cliche, but uh, I just kind of like the sound, got gap, because I imagine that many of us have similar gaps in terms of providing access, supporting the use of media in teaching and research at our institutions and kind of integrating that with our other, uh, our, our other infrastructure and services. Um, so but you might say, well, why has there been so little progress when we've done so well on the preservation side and, and in terms of delivering images and books through our digital library? I mean, I, I think part of the issue is that media technology feels comparatively complex um, uh, with respect to, you know, compared to just serving up still images or books uh, or, you know, scanned manuscripts. It's really been a volatile market in terms of the technology. We've been watching these companies, these solutions come and go. 
Um, and of course, the delivery formats are kind of always evolving. It's really hard to pin down a solution. Um, and of course, so little, li uh, so little of our content can be shared due to the right situation. So that just makes it even more complex. And I think even within, you know, working within the digital library group where I'm situated, there's this perception that media is kind of less relevant for scholarly materials, and, and yeah, you all agree, you, you know what I'm talking about, um, that it's just not as important to get out there as books and manuscripts. But, um, but I know that's not true. And I, start, I thought, well, how are we going to bring attention to this situation? How are we going to get resources on this problem? So um, in the middle of 2013, I decided to launch a strategic planning process that would really kind of heighten awareness about the situation. So um, it was kind of a lightweight process, but you know, we really wanted to explore and expo expose the present state. So I, I pulled together our team, we had a retreat, and we started to, to talk about that issue and, um, and, stake out the, and begin this planning process. We decided to engage with our stakeholders, both within our group and around the Stanford campus, um, as well as at peer institutions, with the goal of expressing our shared vision of the desired future state for delivering and making our media more accessible, and then outlining the steps to get there. Um, as part of getting the, the stakeholders engaged, I convened the Media Access Working Group. Here's some of the members. Uh, we met frequently over a course of about 14 weeks in late last year, leading up to uh, December 15th. Uh, we discussed our issues, we compiled statistics, we did interviews, we tested an early release of Avalon, we produced a six-page report and delivered it straight to the library directors. Um, and here are some of the findings that we found in the course of this, of this work. Uh, patron requests for you know, getting digital copies of our media content is rapidly rising. So we've been tracking this since about the middle of 2008. You can see the graph. We had 69 items requested for digitization last month alone. Just, just a huge, huge uh, sign that you know, there's demand for this stuff. We went to our Google Analytics. Stanford has about, about two dozen digital collection websites. The top ones on our Google Analytics serve up media. We have the Buckminster Fuller Collection, the uh, Lynn Hirschman's Women Art Revolution Collection, and most recently our Riverwalk Jazz Collection. These are our top sites. More key findings. Online access, the, there's such a low volume of our collections, our permanent holdings in, in various repositories on campus. Our archive of recorded sound, one of the biggest archives for sound materials in the nation, has less than 1% of the content online. Special collections, less than 5%. Uh, 5%. Our delivery technology, we do have a streaming service. Um, but it's falling way behind, both in terms of it doesn't have mobile support, it doesn't support the campus firewall, so the only thing we can put up is stuff that we can share with the world. I wish we could share everything with the world, but as you know, we can't. Um, and it lacks integration with our emerging, our emerging digital library infrastructure. Of course, major obstacle is rights. We estimate that depending on what collection, you know, what repository we're talking about, anywhere from 80 to 100% of the material is rights protected. And we are working on emerging, emerging access policies, working with legal counsel, and we're making some really good headway. But um, it's really clear that we have to have a required, uh, we require a controlled access system if we're going to make any of this material available. So some of the recommendations of the working group. We've got to augment our systems and tools that reduced our ingest backlog. I, I failed to mention we do have, a, you know, we've been doing lots of media digitization. We have a backlog of getting it into our digital repository. And at this day and age, as long as it's not in the digital repository, it basically might as well not exist. It might, not, might as well not be digitized yet. Um, so we've got to promote these, these systems, tools, and workflows to get this stuff and, and, and the discovery in use. We have to wrangle the rights further, get better kind of blanket statements that we can really make clear to users and our archivists, everybody in the library, really care, clear what can get put up, what can't, what has to be Stanford only. And um, we realize we have, we, there's a lot of metrics we don't have about how people want to use media, where they want to use it, the kinds of collections that are in most demand. So we need to find ways to gather more metrics so we can form our future decision making. Um, last fall, I, with some other folks on campus, I convened a community of practice at Stanford. So getting all the people at Stanford who are using media 
you know, and this is really ramping up with online classes and that sort of thing. And everybody can make video now, and everybody wants to put it up. But we can't all make it shareable. Everybody wants archiving, but they can't, you know, they, we don't want to have 12 repositories on campus. We want them in the Stanford Digital Repository. So we, com we convene this community of practice to start understanding the broad needs across, across campus. They have a lot of the same issues that we do. And so we're trying to kind of pull together, figure out what makes sense to make centralized services and so on. Um, so the keys to a solution at Stanford Library is to solve problems like this. It's, it, it's, uh, it's a theme we'll hear today all through the open source th uh, thread, the stream. Um, so the technology, it has to be open source. But it also has to be open-minded and flexible. I mean, there's open source software out there, but it, it, it lacks a certain you know, flexibility in terms of tapping it in with your other things that you might have going on. And open source is great, but it's only as good as the community that's involved in it, that they have to go hand in hand. So we have to have a vibrant community, and frankly, one that, that understands digital library needs. Um, we did do some pilots with ShareStream and Kaltura. I'm not going to talk about them today. This was largely driven out of our academic computing uh, group because it, it was part of the course management system. I was invited to kind of pilot with them. I did. It didn't take me long to figure out they weren't going to work for us. So they go away. And meanwhile, Fedora and Hydra are already deeply embedded. In fact, Stanford was one of the founding partners of the, uh, of the Hydra project. So we're deeply invested in these technologies. But the community is really where it's at. Uh, Karen showed a picture from the Hydra Connect meeting. It was in San Diego in January. Last week was the Hydra Connect meeting in Cleveland. There were 147 people there from 40-some institutions. Michigan chartered a bus and sent 20 people there. It was really amazing. Um, but that's, it, it, the community has doubled since January. So Avalon at Stanford. It meets all of our basic needs, both functionally, technically, and philosophically. We tested it in the Media Access Working Group, and we're completely supported by our management. Uh, we're currently hiring a media infrastructure engineer, so if you want to come work with us, the job is open. I'll send you the link. Um, it's been funded through a two-year collection project, which I'll come back and talk about in another MIA, and work is going to start on this ASAP. So that's it. Thank you. We have brief time for questions. Are there any questions? Do you guys want to come up? Drag a chair, I guess. Any questions? Yes. I have a question for John. You said that Hydra isn't necessarily, excuse me, Avalon is not necessarily intended to be the main discovery layer. Would you expand on that a little bit um, in terms of, because it seems like it, it kind of, I kind of feel like it should be. And well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can expand on that a bit. So and maybe by using the, in Indiana as an example. So, um, you know, we're trying to use Avalon to serve uh, uh, media collections from, um, well, depending on how you count, you know, se several dozen to perhaps almost 80 different units on campus that all have different existing practices around description and discovery. So some are library units that have mark records. Uh, in the, the, the library catalog, they're exposed via the, the OPAC. Some are archives that have uh, EAD finding aids. Some have all custom databases, spreadsheets, paper documentation. So we're trying to integrate content from a bunch of different uh, existing practices and existing uh, uh, modes of, of discovery. And we want to continue to support those modes of discovery that are useful to the communities using those, um, those collections now uh, while also using Avalon, I think, to provide an integrated discovery of all of the materials that we do have online. So it is serving a discovery role, but maybe more to kind of showcase what we have and, and for more casual search than for, uh, say, an in-depth uh, research case. Does that, does yeah, that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Jack. Yeah, I, I, I'm really impressed with this project. I'm really happy to see it come to actual you know, fruition and application and use. Um, like one of the one of the great things about Hydra and each project like this is there's so many applications that you can build on them. And then the downside is that there's so many applications that you can build on them. I, I'm wondering if you could speak to the, the kind of development resources, staff wise, expertise wise, that you all rely upon. 
Um, that's a good question. So uh, within the hydro community, there are a bunch of different um, sizes of projects and sizes of institutions. For example, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was a one-man shop. Uh, one guy built, built the entire system, all the applications for their website and for their delivery online. Uh, Stanford and Indiana University obviously have um, a much bigger staff uh, devoted to their projects and, and their crews. GBH had uh, one developer. Uh, we hired DCE to help us uh, get launched. Um, we now have two developers on staff, so we're slowly trying to grow somewhat support. We probably won't go any higher than that, is my guess. So I think it really depends on your institution, what resources you can bring to it. Um, if you adopt a, a solution that someone other institution is using and you're building on that, it'll certainly ramp up your speed of adoption quicker. Um, what else? What else can I add to that? I, I just want to add that, um, again, at this, this meeting at Cleveland last week, uh, on Friday it was kind of like the working group sessions, and so all of the core committers on the Hydro Project got together and a bunch of other people were there. And uh, they got together to talk about how there was, you know, there's starting to be some gems and things coming out that were really similar, what's the difference between this and that, and so everybody was kind of working hard to regroup and figure out what they were going to um, start merging. and, and uh, so my point is that it's a process, and I think Lauren talked about this earlier, how it's, um, <clears throat> you, the community comes together. So maybe you're, you're a one-man shop, or a two-person shop, or a 40-man and woman shop. But, <laughs> but um, when you come together with the community, you, you, you recircle, you regroup, and you, it, it, you're so much more powerful because you start bouncing ideas off of each other, you figure out how to make the code better. Um, so it really is a, an amazing thing to watch the power of the community come together on development. So don't be afraid if you don't have a lot of developer resources because the power of the community comes with it. Yes. Um, yeah comment that sort of follow up uh, to the earlier question. Uh, it's, uh, so if these technologies are developed in the context of uh, universities and, and non-profits, non um, I wonder uh, if you want this also to be taken up outside or you, know, you need a sort of um, infrastructure for support. And I was wondering if you also uh, foresee the uh, setting up of spin-off organizations, companies to actually manage the, the further growth of, of Hydra. So, so far in the community space, Digital Curation Experts is a for-profit vendor of sorts who is supporting the community and supporting the code to some extent. I mean, so they run the camps. Um, Mark can speak to that if, if he's still here. I don't know if he's still here, but um, um, they run camps, for example. You can hire them to help build your code. You can hire them to help build your project. They'll then feed that code that they've just built for you back into the community. They might reuse it on another project that they get hired on to work with. Um, but I think we all agree that it would be great to have more companies like that or more vendors like that in the community space. So I think they are welcome. Um, they just haven't stepped forward yet. Um, I would also say that it is based on Ruby and Rails, um, which is um, uh, a software that's out there in the commercial market, so there are a lot of developers that know that as a language. They might not know the Hydra framework per se, but they know that as a coding language. So what we did on one of our projects was actually hire a local Ruby and Rails developer to come in and specifically help us code different pieces of the project that we were working on. Um, you know, you are competing with the commercial market who are also hiring those developers at higher costs, but we found that that was really efficient. And it actually focused us too. It, it made us really think about what is the specific code we need them to help us build and kind of help us target it. So. Any other questions? Sorry. Any other questions? We're kind of out of time, too. OK, but we're all here, so please feel free to ask us. And the lightning talks this afternoon will get some demos.